<laughs> I'm 6'4". You got about 6'7". So <laughs> I'll squeeze in here. But good morning, guys. Um, welcome to the Roman Hall Show, formerly the best of Evergreen San Jose show. Uh, I'm honored to have uh, Mr. Funk, uh, Chris Funk. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and hanging out with us today. And uh, Mr. Funk's the superintendent of uh, Eastside Union High School District. And uh, honored. We were talking... Uh, before we got so much in common, but for those who don't know Mr. Funk, why don't we dive in, tell us a little bit about your stuff. I usually hate that question, that question of tell me about yourself. But first off, sir, played college basketball like myself, went to Carroll College, but where did you grow up before that, Mr. Funk? Yeah, Roman, I was a, I'm a native of San Jose. Um, my parents moved to California from Ohio back in 1960, uh, and then moved to San Jose in 64, and I was born in 66. I'm a product of San Jose Unified, Trace Elementary, Hoover, Lincoln High School. Hoover. Hoover, okay. yeah. Uh, and then I had a great opportunity. Uh, well, then I went to Ohlone College and played uh, junior college basketball and so baseball. Did the Juco, did the Juco thing I did the before. Juco thing. That's and tough. then Carroll College in Montana. Mm -hmm. Came back, uh, attended San Jose State to get my teaching credential and mm -hmm. my double master's. Um, did you see the Mr. Spang uh, Mr. Spangler that I sent out to you? He's a wrestling coach, Quimby Oakamiddle. He went to Carroll as well, played football. That's right, yeah. They still, they still got a football team there? Uh, they've won four national titles. Oh. Yeah, that's that's really their claim to fame. And, 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 and they're NAIA or they D? They're NAIA, yeah, okay. Division wow. III. Yeah. Wow, so, wow, wow, wow. I didn't mean to say I'm sorry. No, and, and uh, I spent my whole career teaching and in uh, public education. So I had the great privilege of going back and being the principal mm -hmm. of the high school I graduated from. That's, that's got to be crazy yeah. uh when, when you made your stop at San Jose State one thing we picked up on when I turned this on and good morning everyone uh that's joining us was uh the urban leadership program and uh, I think it was kind of unique times for you to be a part of that we have Mr. Wallach on the show and he's actually teaching that but you talk a little bit about you know what that meant to you and uh, we're going to kind of get into that I mean this was uh, an urban leadership program, it was geared more towards the occupation you were eventually going to do after, right? And, I, and my personal opinion is, you know, we should have more feeder things in that way. Um, what, what made you jump on that? And, and did you already have it figured out that I'm going to, I'm going to want to go into administration, I want to become yeah. an educator? Well, I knew I was going to be an educator uh, straight out of college. Both my parents are educators. My uh -huh. mom taught kindergarten for uh, 35 years, and my dad was a high school English drama teacher, wow. high school basketball coach for 35 years. Uh, and so I taught for nine years, and uh, I had no intention of going into administration. Mm -hmm. um, but my wife was pregnant with our second child. She wanted to stay home for a year and go back to San Jose State and get her master's. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had an opportunity to move into administration. And I really thought I was only going to do that for a year or two. Right. And I'd go so right figure back. things out. Yeah. And I'd go right back into teaching and coaching. Um, but once I, I got the bug, uh, once I got the administrative job, I got the bug, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and I got promoted quickly. The first year I was activities, the next year I was the, uh, in charge of instruction, and within five years I was the principal. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you have that opportunity to lead a large organization, right. it's kind of hard to, to go back. Yeah, no, no, and it's made for certain leaders and so forth. Right, right. and so the Urban Leadership Program, I was... I was actually an administrator in that program earning my credential. I was the only one. Everyone else were teachers still teaching in the classroom. Right. Uh, so that was a challenge, too, because yeah, it's yeah. theory uh, applied to the mm -hmm. real-life experience. What are, the, what are the biggest differences? I mean, when you're a teacher, you're following a certain curriculum. Uh, when you're doing this and jumping in for administration, this probably you were we were kind of making up the curriculum as you go. It's more structured, more organizational, more delegation of responsibility. What would you say is? Yeah, when you're a teacher, you're you're the king of your kingdom, right? Right. You go right. and and of and your the, specific the, subject. Of your, uh, exactly. And the challenge is that teaching can be very isolating, right? Because you're in your classroom, four door, you know, the door of four walls, and you're mm -hmm. by yourself. In administration, every decision you make, everyone in that community mm -hmm. has something to say about it. Right. You know, they're going to critique you. Got, I was, uh, I was saying to them off camera, I'm like, you know, the more I study you, the more I realize I don't want your job. <laughs> yeah. It's never easy, but carry on, please. Well, and so with administration, um, you, the, the what I've always tried to do is what I call distributive leadership. I try to make sure that everyone has a voice. Uh, I don't claim to have all the answers uh, and, and more people in the room 
and you can tap that social capital, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be able to find those answers, and then you have better buy-in. Right. Uh, but then there is a time where you have to make a decision, and sometimes those decisions don't please everyone. And, and that's by, a challenge that we face. buy-in, uh, Chris, you mean everyone feels that they're involved, everyone feels that they're a part of the process. Absolutely, right? do yes. That. I feel that's so important. Um, Player versus coach, before we get on to that good stuff, uh, I learned the hard way is that being a player and be, being a college athlete and then having the patience of being a coach. Are you struggling with that now? Uh, what advice you know, would you give to them? And I, I know we've talked that we wish when we're all done we'll come back and start coaching again, but what was the experience like for you, you know? Um, that and parents. Dealing yeah, with you, know, you know, I uh, right out of college uh, I was coaching uh, and I love getting out and playing with the kids. So we would work on the drills, we would work on the fundamentals, and then when it was time to play... You can actually show them. I could actually show them and get out there. Yep. Um, and what I realized was that I had more control as a player during the game than as a coach. Because as a coach, of course, you have the opposing players, the opposing coach, but then you have the officials. Mm -hmm. Right, and as a coach, you can't control what the officials do. That's the hardest part for me. There's, there's other elements that are simply out of our control. Absolutely, right? uh, and so I think I grew as a coach my ten years coaching, uh, and then when I got into administration, I stepped down for coaching, and then when my kids entered middle school, mm -hmm. uh, I coached their uh, AAU teams, and I thought I was much more calm and effective as a coach than I was when I was coaching varsity high school basketball. Interesting, yeah, because be I was just more mature. Yeah, that and so then you did the summer thing, right? And then there's not as much as the elements. AAU is a beautiful thing. I think any advice anybody who wants to play basketball, I always say that summers are everything. Yeah. Right? Everyone who relaxes in the summer and who you can come back in one summer and completely transform. And Absolutely. that's why I want to have uh, Mike Rutter on the show soon. He's uh, he said he coached a, a, a little, little bit because he's doing a little one on one aside from San Jose City Women's College. He, was, he says hello uh, to you as well. And then while we're on, your, your son, I heard you say Monterey. Where's uh, where's he at right now? So uh, yeah, well, Mike is a, a was one of the all time great barrier shooters. He was just Period. a great lefty. Period. He can shoot some from distance. When we still talk can. about still Clay can. and Steph being shooting from distance, Mike was one of the original distance shooters. Uh, and he's worked with my youngest son. My youngest son is a uh, sophomore, freshman eligibility at West Valley College, uh, okay. playing basketball, earning, right. he'll earn his AA this year. Yeah. Uh, and my oldest just graduated from uh, Cal State Fullerton uh, last summer. That's awesome. And, and you mentioned West Valley College. Um, I remember Coach Fernandez told me, Roman, you really want to test the waters? Go out to West Valley College yep. in the summer. And it was it was organized. It was uh, you bring your own five, very short. Yeah. And uh, my, my college buddies here, and it's funny because he would come too, and we were watching the Lakers last night, and uh, uh, Brooke Lopez was just, you know, playing, wandering around. And d during that time was the summers where, you know, he and I walked in, and Brooke and his brother were there just about to be freshmen at Stanford, right? Great opportunity. So it's kind of a, a trip to, yeah. um, obviously, Iron Sharpens Iron, so you get to, to see uh, them, but it's a trip to see people like them. My last high school game was against uh, Jeremy Lin and Palo Alto. Mm. But then you kind of go in your mind that, like, wow, no one's going to believe me that we were on that, that yeah. level. You know, but, was Bob Burns still the coach, or was it Danny <sighs> Yoshikawa? Uh, so Yoshikawa uh, was running the show as okay. an assistant at the time, which means Bob was probably the the, the head coach, yep. and then uh, we just never saw him around. He had Yoshikawa. Uh, I'm, yeah, sure, I'm sure there's rules to that. He's yeah, not allowed yeah, yeah. to be on the floor right. and all that yeah. kind of stuff. But see, this is what I was afraid of. We were going to go on a tangent on, on basketball, but uh, but the main thing we want to talk about, a lot of stuff uh, going on, a lot of stuff happening. You know, I was planning on uh, being Mr. Funk re regardless. Um, and I know it's something that are on, on people's mind. I almost, you know, didn't want to bring up the elephant in the room, but I just want to, I, my main goals. I want to talk about high school. First of all, you know, it's, it's such an uh, evolving thing, evolving time in our life. Some people uh, feel that, um, you know, I had to learn about a parallelogram, uh, but no one ever taught me how to do uh, accounting yeah. or to do anything like that, right? I just want to educate everybody else and give them some value that, you know, first of all, um Mr. Funk is not where Chris is not you know say all be all. There's a board of trustees. Why don't we why don't we educate them on that too, so I can learn as well. So as far as California goes, Mr. Funk, there's there's yourself, superintendent, just of a specific high school district. There's the board of trustees, and then 
Uh, Mr. Wallace was telling me about there's a state assemblyman that's in charge of education or budget or what's your understanding? Of well, that? you have a state superintendent of education okay. and then you have a state board of education. Right. And they are the total, have total authority over the curriculum and the funding. Uh, well, the funding actually is through the legislature. Okay. Um, but just in San Jose alone, we have 19 school districts. Uh, and so each school district wow. has a superintendent and each school district has elected officials. Mm -hmm. And so technically I have five bosses. Mm -hmm. uh, then those are the elected officials. And I'm the primary person that they hire. And then I hire everyone below me. Right. Um, and in East Side, being a high school district, the largest high school district in Northern California, we have seven feeder districts mm. uh, that feed into us. In Mid each, middle school, high school, I'm mean, excuse me, middle school, elementary school yep. districts. And right. each of them have a superintendent and wow. each of them have board of trustees. So it's a very complicated uh, system we have in California. Right. Uh, and then it's the state that provides our funding. And once we receive the funding, then we're responsible for... Uh, balancing that that budget, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't get to control how much funding comes into the district. Right. We only control once the money comes to us. Right, right. So re recommendation of them is really take a look at um, you know who the powers of being decision makers are in the state legislature and state assembly. We had former superintendent uh, uh, Joe Cotto we were talking about. He went up there for a little bit. No longer there? Is he still? No, he's retired. He's yeah. retired yeah. now. Uh, I heard amazing things about Mr. Cotto and his charisma and so forth. Uh, so I'd love to at some point reach out to him. I'm sure there's a lot we can uh, learn from him. But the second that, longest tenured superintendent east side. Joe Cotto. Awesome. 12, 12 years, I believe. Those are stories, you know. I am Mr. Welch again. Just talk about how you could walk into a room of parents writing and then just give them punch and cookies and calm everybody down. He had that, that charisma to him, and I'm sure he did great things. Uh, but back to cur uh, curriculum, um, I, I, how does this... This just gets handed down to you of, okay, we just got rid of the high school exit exam, mm -hmm. right? People were for it, people were uh, against it, didn't think it was a great idea, but um, it's such a tough position because you're never going to please everybody, right? right? How are these decisions made for um, those that argue, you know, why am I learning uh, Algebra 2 and so forth? Why is this not specific to my you know, occupation and so forth? Um, how do amendments to curriculums and so forth get thrown out and thrown in? Is this all happening back at this level we just talked about? or? Um... Yeah, really, uh, curriculum is designed and developed at the state level. Okay. Um, but locally, uh, schools can take the standards that are adopted by the state uh, and then develop curriculum around those standards. Mm. Unfortunately, in California, it's always tied to, and the federal government, it's always tied to some standardized test at the end of the year. Right, because um, there's got to be something. Even though high school exit exam is now gone, I mean, we still got SATs in order to get into college. Yeah. Um, and those Absolutely. sorts of things. So, so there's got to be a balance between what is required to get into college and what is meaningful for kids and learning, right? And that's why in Eastside we have 19 different uh, career pathways right. that are tied to career technical education. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree, there needs to be much more flexibility. We should have seminar classes that maybe are six to eight weeks long on financial literacy, mm -hmm. on uh, your application process to college, financial aid, mm -hmm. uh, things that keep kids interested in school. Right. Uh, because right now, a lot of kids are interested simply because of the extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. But we've got to do a much better job making the curriculum more hands-on and meaningful right. for our students. Right, right. I agree with you. Yeah, no, uh, one thing I want to bring up, you're probably not familiar with this, but the case study that was done uh, in, in Finland. Uh, there's things I agree with, things that I disagree with. I mean, we're dealing with the entire United States. Finland's a little easier to control, uh, and those are at different levels, but I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but you know, they believe that increasing more uh, recess time or pretty much uh, starting school a little later uh, in the day or having shorter times, and the biggest thing was they eliminated homework, and, and they went from being one of the, in the last places in the nation to being um, at the very top, actually being number one. Yeah. But this was at whole different world at elementary level versus high school level and you know it, it, it's, it's a weird conundrum we got parents working um all, all day they might be angry that they just got to pick up their kid right daycare is a huge issue right. um what, what are your thoughts uh about about that and um i'm not sure if you get yeah. a chance to even look into well that. context is everything right? right so when you look at fin finland you're looking at a very 
homogeneous state. Mm -hmm. um, True. You don't have the English learners that we have. Uh, the cost of living is outrageous here compared to there. So you have parents here that are working two, three jobs just to survive. And so maybe some parents, even though in their hearts they want the very best for their child, they may not be there to observe and support them with their homework. Right. Uh, but there are things that I like about the Finland education. And for instance, teachers spend 51% of their time mm -hmm. with their colleagues mm -hmm. developing their content knowledge. Mm -hmm. Versus grading. Correct. Right. Yeah. Now, kids are in school longer day. Right. They may start later, but they're right. in school longer. But a teacher doesn't have a caseload of 150, 160 kids that they see five days a week for an, at least an hour a day. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's huge. I think right. we need to reduce the caseload for teachers so that they can spend more time on their content and their pedagogy. Right. Uh, and But kids need to be given uh, other opportunities at learning. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think you need to see your English teacher every single day to become an effective writer or reader. Um, I don't think you need to see your math teacher every single day because that just tends to lead to the drill and kill mm -hmm. that you and I went through in math. Right. right? So. Um, so I think there's things we can learn from Finland, but context is always right. very important. Here's one actually I'm thinking a lot about is public versus private and how much that's a concern. Um, I think we went to Oak Grove, you remember Oak Grove for what it was, and um, I was talking to Coach Francis Baz and, and he mentioned to me that uh, they were always D1, obviously by D1 meaning population uh, of school. And they were talking about the fact that they've seen such small amounts. It's my personal opinion that Quimby and Chibuya has the greatest athletes that ever lived. Uh, as far as those are, those are two middle schools yeah. that feed our athletes. Uh, on a sports take, as soon as they're any uh, good, we all know that they get snatched up by you know West Catholic Athletic League, Midi, Be Bellman. Uh, and I don't mean snatched up, at, at their own will, of course. Who wouldn't want a private school education for their kids? But I start to think, um, the more and more that I see, I went to Pala Middle School like in these, and now it's called uh, Escuela Popular, it's mm -hmm. a, this private firm. We're seeing more and more of these privates. Um, what are your thoughts, personal opinions on that, the future, that if things do continue to go private uh, with time, uh, what's, what's going to happen to to public and I'm wondering if those decision makers in their minds are blowing off public and then thinking, oh, well, my, I mean, th their kids are probably in private school, right? Yeah. They're thinking, uh, well, it's, it's all going to go private anyways, but budget is not, you know, not important for, for these, you know, schools. What are your thoughts on that? Well, so there are two systems uh, outside of the public education. There's public charter schools, mm -hmm. and then there's private schools. Mm -hmm. And typically, parents tend to send their kids to private schools because they're more, they're parochial, mm -hmm. and, and, and they want that religious factor, which is, mm -hmm. which is understandable, but... Mm -hmm. My point is that if you're willing to send your child to Bellamy or to Harker mm -hmm. for high school at $22,000 a year, right. and the state funds us at $10,000 a year right. per child, right. there's a discrepancy there, Huge. right? Yeah. And so you're not just paying uh, for a smaller class size, you're paying for what it takes to really educate your child. Yeah. And more power to you. Mm -hmm. But then the state needs to fund public schools so that we can offer some of the things that a smaller private high school can offer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then with charters, uh, since they are public schools, they're draining resources from schools. So we have 12 charters in East Side, right. and uh, it's about 4,000 students. Mm -hmm. So 4,000 times 10,000 per person, mm -hmm. that's how much money is leaving. About $15 million is leaving our system to go to the charter schools wow. in East Side. Well, and, and I'm sure, you know, in your huddle up groups, have you guys been talking about ways to counter this? Um, it made me proud on YouTube uh, to randomly see uh, East Side Union High School District um, kind of commercial and kind of talking about why you should attend. I'm not sure if it was Andrew Hill or yep. Santa Teresa or so forth. And the reality is um, you guys got to compete. Yeah. And you're competing and then I'm talking to some of these teachers and they're like, we already have you know, two dollars per kid for as far as pencils and those type of things for them. Um, given you guys have your own budget, now you have to give up a portion to actually market and compete with these, right? Um, we are com we're, we are marketing now. We've never done it before in like the uh, history of time, right? Exactly. It, it Public shows, schools usually don't do that. Yeah, it shows how the evolution of times and how things uh, are changing. It was very interesting to to me, right? So I'm still grabbing my left. 
How are we tackling that? How well, you... I, I've hired... As from, if you don't have enough to do. <laughs> I've hired from the private sector um, a director of marketing, and that's her background, that's her degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for the last two and a half, three years, uh, we've been marketing in uh, Semina, uh, in the theaters. We've been doing Pandora, YouTube. Uh, we've been sending postcards home. Uh, we do That's brochures. That's be better than some franchises I've been yelling at and trying to consult them. And, and first off, for something like this, you, you know, if, if uh, Chris wanted to, he would just send this marketing director to me. So I'm super grateful and thankful that you took the time to do this because we get this this insight, you know. But uh, but Karen, you, that's kind of been the marketing strategy, right? And Absolutely. It's, especially we've revamped all of our websites, right. and uh, and it's also about customer service. Right. We just gotta get better. Yep. Because public schools traditionally, the kids came to us no matter what. Mm -hmm. Now there's competition, so we've got to improve our customer service. Right. And then with teachers, the one thing is that that I've actually liked is. They've always been kind of incentivized for the longer you stay there, the longer your, your I mean, your pay scale yes. kind of goes, right? right? And I feel that's a, a positive thing that, you know, huge races don't do as much. They kind of incentivize uh, things for you. Um, how have you guys dealt with that? One thing we were talking about was on, on next door. I think it was uh, two nights ago that... It's so tough when you're the person in charge and you're the boss on where to cut what and how to prioritize um, money. But there was some talks about uh, about uh, I think it was counselors yep. as well as budget cuts. And you guys are already doing things. I think during my day doing furloughs and stuff like that to try to save money way back in the day, right? Um, yeah. I mean, were, were furloughs a way to uh, correct me if I'm wrong. They, they were budget? back during the recession. Yeah. Okay. Got we it. don't do furlough days anymore. Okay. Uh, wonderful. Uh, what a. That that's got to be the toughest part uh, of your job. They were talking about some type of meetings going on as far as um, school counselors, which I can understand the outreach because it's so important that kids understand the CSU and UC requirements and um, how to how to do all that. Um, I mean, some of the, the claims were they're already overloaded X amount of students to one. Now one may or may not have to be plucked. Um, you chose a really easy job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, so I'm in my six, completing my sixth year as superintendent. Right, right. The first five years, our teachers have had five straight years of pay raises. Mm -hmm. um, and we hired over 205 new employees in the last five years. Mm -hmm. uh, but now the, the state funding has ended. Uh, so all of a sudden, um, the funding now is just COLA. Mm -hmm. And COLA does not cover step and column on the salary mm -hmm. schedule, STRS and PERS, which is retirement, and health benefits. And so when you have less revenue coming in from the state and your expenses continue to climb, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we have to look at potential layoffs. Right. Um, and so last June, when the board approved our three-year budget, and we always have to submit a three-year budget to mm -hmm. the county, and at any point of those three years, you have to have a minimum of a 3% reserve. And typically, uh, your reserve is the lowest that third year out. Mm -hmm. um, and we were showing a $27 million deficit in the third year. And so in order to eliminate that, mm -hmm. you either have to find savings negotiated savings, whatever that may be, class size, what have you, benefits, or you have to do layoffs. And so the board said that we're going to do layoffs, but not pr about program. So mm -hmm. we're not cutting electives like art, music. Right, uh, right. We're cutting non-classroom personnel, the support structure. So who right, are they? Right. They're advisors, they're counselors, mm. they're instructional coaches. And so mm. that's not easy because we've built Everyone that. Everyone matters, right? Yeah, yeah and yeah, we've built it's... that since I've been there. In fact, we have two more counselors today mm -hmm. than we had in 2007. That's how many counselors we've hired in the right. last five years. Right, right, right. And now we're potentially looking at... Um, those uh, layoffs and so that's why I've been having meetings at every single school site since September to inform them of what's going on and to ask for their input on what do they prior what's their priority mm -hmm. and some options and so the board just the other night passed a resolution to put a partial tax mm -hmm. on and East Side has been great commu our community has been great supporting our bonds mm -hmm. but we've never been able to pass a parcel and that's going to be critical. That's going to be on the June election. Uh, what, what rec oh, there you go. What recommendation do you give to those parents or people listening who want to get involved or, uh, you know, 
and they, they have every right to you know, talk about their personal uh, opinion and so forth. Are there certain meetings or anything that's going to be going on to discuss these issues where they can voice their personal opinions and get feedback? Absolutely. So they can email myself and board members, okay. and then the next board meeting is Monday the 26th, okay. and that's when the board will make their final decision. All right. And then so population is going to go up, right? Ever, how are you guys going to deal with uh, the factor of knowing when an additional school, like, for example, Morgan, Morgan Hill was always just Live Oak, and now right. we got Sobrado, right? We created Evergreen because Mount Pleasant and Silver Creek were overflowing, and now Evergreen's overflowing, right? Yeah, it is. Um, it was built for 1600 originally. Right, and um, how does one deal uh, with the next step or even recognize... Uh, the need, then you would have to go. We'd have to go back to upstairs and request that and yeah. so address that. We've done two demographic uh, studies in the last five years, and with their and the reason why we have deficits and we're looking at layoffs is because we're in decline enrollment actually. Yeah. Um, and so in the next, I mean, yeah. yeah, population's going up, but because but enrollment's declining, and the answer to that is what we brought up earlier. Public versus private, right? If you put right. your finger on it. Yeah. Um, well, that and so just in the east side zip codes, the birth rate's going down right now, actually. Even though the California population is going up in the Bay Area, you know, just swarming with people. Very interesting. Um, but so you, the birth rate's going down. And then what you also have is you have empty nesters, like my wife and I, both of our <laughs> kids are out of high school. Um, we're not quite ready to retire. Right. Do we sell our house for 1.3 million, buy a condo for a million? Mm -hmm. No one's going to do that. They're going to. We're going to wait till we're ready to retire and move out. Mm -hmm. And so what's so happening? They're, so is they're sitting still. They're sitting still. Yeah. Uh, they're age. Our communities are aging out, mm -hmm. but there's no inventory. Interesting. Um, and then when there is, it, it's it's usually families that are just starting off in condos, townhouses, uh, and it's going to take eight nine years for those kids to get to us. So we're. Our high, 26,000, we're mm -hmm. currently at 23,000, mm -hmm. and it shows in the next six years, eight years, we're gonna be down to 18,000 students. So even Evergreen is projected to drop from 2,800 to 2,000. Wow, interesting, yeah. interesting. And I'm 30 years old, right? And my wife married one year, and my, my wife's saying, oh, let's hold on a little bit. So you gotta start kids. working, man. Yeah, no, and she uh, she's at UCSF with babies every day, but I, I think that kind of answers the question with the mindset becomes, you know, people aren't waiting a lot earlier They're to, waiting. Have, to have kids and yeah. so forth. And they tend to only have one or two. Uh, so specialization, that's one thing I want to do, uh, kind of talk about. We're seeing more in the middle school, seeing more technology stuff for those parents who are listening out there. Uh, uh, another reason why you should uh, have your kids go to Eastside Union High School District. Um, what, what kind of things are you guys putting forward? Uh, I'm completely ignorant to, to STEM. I heard that word thrown out there yeah. a lot. What, what is STEM for, for parents that don't know? STEM is just abbreviation for um, science, technology, math, and engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the goal is to make sure that you have uh, pl the, the pathway for kids to take math all the way up to calculus their senior year, that you have the ability for engineering classes that pathway, multiple science classes that pathway. And so mm -hmm. typically your middle schools are not that strong in their math science program. Right. And we really need to move that down. Fortunately, our community passed an ed tech bond. So every five years, we sell a series of bonds that we pay off uh, and we can refresh our technology that way. So instead of using bond money to finance a, a computer for 30 years right. and the lifespan is four years, right. we now can uh, refresh those every four to five years and make sure that our kids and our students have the best technology. That's awesome. And then robotics, things of, of that nature, um, classes are all going to be a part of those type of things. Yeah, right? so right now robotics are mostly just clubs. And mm -hmm. that's the problem is there's not a set curriculum or funding from the state. And so sites typically have to fundraise for that. Mm -hmm. uh, those kids are amazing what mm -hmm. they put together with these robotic mm -hmm. competitions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the volunteers from the community that support us. It's very cool. But it's all fundraising. Mm -hmm. uh, and that weighs on people, right? right. You want to just, you want to get in there and teach and work with the kids. You don't want to have to worry about fundraising to actually go off to the tournaments right. uh, that take place. All right. I took a tour with uh, Mrs. Kelly, Lauren Kelly. She, uh -huh. She's awesome. Uh, and she was giving me a tour of everything. And then uh, she goes, and this is uh, the mental health counselor. I'm like, 
oh, I'm only 10 years out. We didn't have no mental health counselor, right? right? And she said, no, that's very important. And, you know, we all have problems the same way we do. I just wanted to get your, your personal opinions, your thought on, you know, the state of, of kids. We have uh, bu bullying becomes an issue, but now we're, we're always evolving, right? Now we have cyber bullying, right? And yeah. so forth. Um, does that come up at the table uh, at all? And uh, you know, how, how do you tackle like something like that of, I mean, that, that's a little different than an advisor, an academic counselor. I mean, this has got to be probably a psychologist, right, yep. of some sort. Absolutely. They're, um, they have their uh, clinical technician. Their uh, is, that, is that yeah. standard in all 18 now? Uh, uh, we, we have a full-time social worker at every high school, and they have anywhere from two to five interns from San Jose State working towards their wow. uh, credential. That's yeah, a great, a great idea. Have Bring the interns in because they're getting real life. Absolutely. Right then and there, right? Yeah. And you know, uh, we have a lot of kids uh, that are stressed. Uh, more and more kids have thought about suicide uh, in the last five years than ever before. The pressures on our, on our students are just tremendous. Um, I mean, I've, like I said, I grew up in San Jose. I remember when the orchards were here. I remember mm -hmm. I could leave at seven in the morning and not come home until dinner time. And my parents were okay with that. You can't do that nowadays with the right. traffic, with the crime, with uh, just all the pressures that we have on our kids. And, right. and they need that support. Right, right. It's that social emotional learning that's critical. No, I think it's so important. I'm so happy you guys are, are doing that. Uh, I'm throwing all the cra crazy ones uh, at you, and I appreciate you're taking them like a champ. But you just said crime. One thing that, that really, you know, uh, angered me. Yeah. Okay, so that goes to show. It's not just public schools. We're just talking about... Um, Harker, but 6 a.m., you know, a criminal comes in class, and, and you can look up the story for the rest. Uh, that's probably the most difficult challenge, and that's been the aura we were talking about earlier, was um, people in Parkland hadn't trained for an active shooter situation. I've been out since 2005, and I remember specifically us training for yep. active shooter situations, barricading the door, so it's very um, cool to see that. Um, if something like this happens, how do you guys put in systems place for those parents? Because if I could choose one thing, probably for your son as well, it's, it's safety, right? Absolutely. And we were talking before, but how do you not get to the point of having metal detectors, right? But also figuring things out. So there's, there's code levels. I heard the word code red thrown around for parents that don't know. That immediately tells a teacher to what level of, to, to react and do certain scenarios. Yeah, I mean the training has uh, has evolved and changed depending on whether you're SJPD, the sheriff's department, what have you. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, a code red means that there is an active shooter mm -hmm. uh, on campus, and that means that if you're in your classroom, you should lock that classroom mm -hmm. and move away from the doors and windows. Right. Um, and if you have and to not let anybody in, even including students at, at that time, because those students should be in their own respective class. And that's well, the tough part, right? Yeah, but it, but if you see a student walking by when you're trying to lock the door, let, let that student in. Sense, yeah. But the new training also says that if you have the ability to run and leave, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it also talks about if if you can't run, you can't hide, then fight. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but ideally, you don't want to take a, on a person that has a handgun Never, or a rifle. Yeah. You want to get out of the area. Or and you give can't them what they want in that moment to make sure I be safe. Survival is priority number Survival one. Survival is priority. Yeah, and as a former high school principal, uh, every single day my number one priority was the safety of, of that campus, of the students and the, and the faculty. And, you know, I believe in human uh, uh, humanity and I believe in uh, open access. Mm -hmm. I don't want... Um, metal detectors. I don't want right. fencing all around my camp. I want to be inclusive. I want it to be welcoming. It should be a um, safe zone. Right? And we all yeah, just yeah. have to be vigilant. All right. eyes have to be open on that. What do you think about this, Chris? And we're not going to go down the road of, uh, of gun control and that whole thing, but I was looking at the January 1st like laws that came into place, and one of them were the fact that um, Nobody on campus, even if they you know, have a license to, to carry a gun, no teacher. Some teachers might feel, well, Chris, I'm keeping one on me at my desk in case something happens. Then the decision was made on the California level that a uh, teacher should not be able right. to do that. And some people had their opinions were like, well, they can stop someone. And then on the other side, no, they shouldn't need to because, you know, there will be police officers, you know, on campuses. So 
is one typically assigned per school, a two? Yeah, so, so we do have a budget that yeah. uh, uh, allocates for a full-time police officer to be on every site every single day. Right. The problem is we haven't had officers for almost two and a half, three years wow. because the level of uh, the SJPD has dropped they had significantly. Cuts too. They, yeah, yeah. they had huge cuts. And so as they're building their staff back up, we'll, we'll have more officers coming back. Because right now, the officers that are there are mandatory overtime behind the wheel. Well, if you're day off, you're now working overtime behind the wheel, you're not going to be working at the, at the school. Right. And really, officers are simply there to keep bad people off the campus right. and to build relationships. That's really the two roles that they do. Right. Um, yeah, I don't, want, I don't want teachers, I don't want staff members carrying guns because first and foremost, you're not trained. Yep. You know, just going to um, a shooting range and firing your gun every so often doesn't make you a competent person to handle. Or you it walk out. out into the bathroom now you got live ammo on your desk and somebody else, some kid gets all of it. Absolutely, I could I could see that. Yeah. absolutely. So uh, I'm not for that at all. In right. fact, if that ever would happen, I would get out of education because right. that's just that's an accident waiting to happen. Right, right. I can completely completely see that, I, and I agree. And you got so many kids around; it's hard enough watching all of them. No, right. I don't know, you know. And no matter how tragic uh, Sandy Hook was, this latest one in Florida, right. uh, they're all tragic. Yeah. Uh, but when you think about how many schools there are across the United States, that's great. That's great it point. really doesn't happen that often. Right. Um, and so let's not overreact. Right. But it, it's just, let's hope a school never has to face that. Right, right. Uh, I completely agree. And then with social media, with all this today, when something does happen, it's personified, right, on, a, oh, yeah. on another level. And, um, and that's honestly, I feel is a root of the problem is kind of, I don't know if my parents watch local news, I would switch it off with them, but sometimes it's, the theme seems to be fear, 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 right? We're in fear of our neighbors, it's killer bees, it's H1N1, it's flu vaccine, it's what it's, sells. this happens, yes, yeah. exactly. And that correlation, I think it's way more important to have podcasts like this, when you can learn so much more of how to uh, uh, make change, you know? Yep. Uh, I think, um, you know, we, oh, last thing, uh, we, we covered everything on the top of my head, but for those who don't know, um, uh, California, first year JC Free, right? Did you hear about that? Uh, yeah, if you qualify. If you qualify. It's based on, you know, free and reduced lunch. Ah, uh, so it's not a hundred percent that anyone goes for free. Interesting. Yeah, it's and kind that, of the sliding scale yep. concept. And, and this is out of your realm, but then we've seen if you're a New York resident, College all four years in New York is officially free. I'm not sure if that had its own stipulations, too, or I could be mistaken. It was somewhere else, Tennessee. Yeah. Do you feel that um, that should be the case? Uh, I mean, you're, well, you're not a dean yet. Of yeah. <laughs> I, I I would I would first say that college is not for everyone. Right. But the right to go to college is for everyone. Right. right? It right. should be a personal decision and based on your performance. There shouldn't be any adult in the system that says you should go and you shouldn't. Uh, it should be based on your performance. However, before they pay for college for everyone, let's fully fund public K-12 education. No well said, no well said. And we don't realize it, and your son will later, uh, even being into college uh, athletics, I think the, the biggest thing is when I got out and I realized my brother and sister what kind of loans they had on their head. Yeah. And I was just so grateful to have a, a clean slate right there. Um, but uh, they're amazing, Mr. Funk. I'm so happy this has nothing to do with these other topics. This is this is kind of just a about Mr. Funk Rapid Fire. I do the same questions with um, everybody um, that I wanted to just ask you. I'll just pick a um, a few from from then. Uh, we'll start off with uh, what obsessions do you explore on the evenings and weekends. You kind of told me about that. You woke up already swam a bunch of laps lately and then doing doing some yoga too so i do yoga on the weekends and i love going to the beach uh particularly uh get a beach workout and and take my dog there super active i, I love it uh what um so that would probably be part of, part of your morning uh rituals um here's one if you could give any uh advice you can throw in, in the Chris time machine you go back you get to see Chris at 20 25 30 yeah uh, you're only allowed to say one thing to him and give him some advice uh, looking back um, what would you uh, say 
to him, what, what, what piece of advice would you give them? Compound interest. Um, <laughs> understand it and start putting money away early. The, Even if it's just $20 uh, a month. Albert Einstein said it was the greatest mathematical invention ever created was compounding interest, right? Uh, uh, absolutely. That, no, that's, that's a good one. That's the first one. Uh, this one's really important to me was... Um, how was a failure or what seemed like at the time was a huge failure and you down down on yourself uh, that actually set you up for later success that was a blessing in disguise that kind of veered you one way I feel like everybody's got one I feel like those are so important they should be not looked at and that goes back to that anxiety all these yeah. kids are screwed they're worried about messing up when absolutely you gotta you gotta mess up to you know to learn like yeah. I, I was joking around but I'm like Coach, I've never seen them making so many missed layups. They're, they make all their threes, but now when it comes to any anxiety thing of failure, it's yeah. like, but what would be yours you can remember on the trail back that? Oh, it, very vivid. It was my senior year in college. It, it, I had a run in with my coach. Uh, it didn't go well. And um, uh, I still remember uh, being released with eight games left. Not released from the team, but no longer playing, no longer traveling with the team. Right. I still have my scholarship and what have you. This is at Carroll. Um, this was at Carroll, my uh, senior year. Similar story. And okay. so um, for the longest time, I had that chip on my shoulder when I left college. And I think that's why I probably was a little too intense as a high school coach early on in my career. Um, and I think... People just have to forgive themselves. Right. You know, I I held a lot of anger over that, mm -hmm. uh, and then I a lot of that anger was just myself because I had never played sports my entire life. Always been the man. Never had a coach cut you off like that. Yeah, and and I own some of that too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we have to be able to slow down, take a breath, reflect, and forgive and drop. Drop our own egos. I feel ego Absolutely. egos a killer of all relationships, and we all have it. Yep. And being able to find that, um, I've talked about it before, but it's funny is I totally forgave uh, Rudder on this. Tore, tore my knee up for the second time. Uh, I'm still at Notre Dame, and all of a sudden, uh, oh yeah, the scholarship money just wasn't there. And that wasn't on right. Rudder. That was on on, on Puro. So mm -hmm. I was so down on myself. I'm going to Arizona State. Forget all this. Uh, and then Coach Fernandez was the one that you know chewed me out, and I got an opportunity at San Francisco State, and he said, uh, "You better, you better take that, right? You're gonna regret, sure. you're gonna regret it for the rest of your life." Right. Even though my mind said I was over the, the politics of, of basketball, right. and then it ended up veering me on this course of just being the best shape of my life. The amazing people I met at San Francisco State, and um, sometimes. Screwing up is not the end of everything, right? No, it's a, absolutely it's, not. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Um, your, your favorite quote? There's one quote. I'm sure there's a lot that you live by, uh, by often. Oh, you know, I'm a, I grew up being a John Wooden fan. Uh, and so in basketball, it's it like was Coach always... Is, what's that? It's like Coach Fernandez. He's huge on John yeah. Wooden. So in basketball, it was be quick, don't hurry. Uh, but in life, uh, success is a peace of mind knowing that you did the very best that you're capable of doing. Trying to accomplish your goal. I love it. Uh, that was one of my favorites of his, and he talks about uh, the little things. Um, focus on the little things. The little things make big things happen. And John Wynn was an amazing guy. If you guys don't know who he is, look him up. The UCLA coach, probably one of the all-time greatest championships, but more importantly, a great uh, leader. You know, um, I think. Go yeah, I was just going to say uh, he, the other thing he talked about was preparation, hard work. Trump's talent. Mm, always, right? Yep. That's everything. Amazing. Any, any uh, last uh, you know, requests from my audience or uh, where can we f find you or any, any you know, maybe parent or something like that who uh, says, like, what, do you, what do you recommend? They, they shoot you an email or something? Absolutely. Maybe? Email is probably the best way because I, uh, I respond to all my emails within, I try to respond to all my emails within 24 hours. Uh, and um, and visit our website and and learn all the great programs that we have on East Side and any questions that you have. I, and I'm also willing to meet with small groups too. That uh, if there's a group of parents, associations that want to get together and learn more about East Side, love to do it. I'm Mr. Funk. Thank you so much. I think this is a insane value. Don't wait until go on the podcast as well, but uh, we really appreciate you. You know, you got, you're super busy and stuff. And hey, my means, pleasure. Means Thank a lot you. To me. For, I'm yeah. sure they'll appreciate it. Thanks for giving back to the community. Awesome. Take care, guys.